This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 95. Marcella Lewin can help you navigate the new world of content management. In the modern omnichannel world, it's important to store and manage your content in a way that lets you present it in any number of channels, on a website, in a mobile app, or via a voice assistant. A headless CMS is the technology that makes this new way of managing content possible. Content modeling is the practice that ensures that your content's purpose is clear wherever it appears. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 95 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Marcella Lewin. Marcella is the founder of Headless Creator. Uh, And uh, well, Marcella, tell the folks, welcome, first of all, and tell the folks a little bit more about Headless Creator and uh, what you do there. Hi, Larry. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy uh, and honored to be on your podcast. 95 episodes. Wow. That's a lot of episodes. That's, uh, wow. I, I gave you major kudos for total consistency on continuing a podcast. That's a lot of uh, shows you put on there. So awesome. Thanks. But thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, Like you said, I'm the founder of headlesscreator.com. It's um, a website that offers free courses uh, supported by the community, meaning that I I have uh, corporate support from the headless CMS companies to keep the, the website pretty much free. Uh, and people can um, uh, attend courses on a variety of topics, all on headless CMSs, um, uh, content modeling, which is my passion. Um, uh, I also work as a senior content solutions architect for a major uh, SaaS company, uh, doing content link, content modeling uh, on a daily basis on a variety of projects. I I really love content modeling, um, so that's kind of like where I am today. And uh, you know, there's there's other stuff, but that's where I'm at today. You are a busy guy. Thanks for taking the time <laughs> to come <laughs> talk to me. Um, hey, well, you know, a couple. Of, I, I'd love to start by talking about like just a little bit about the CMS environment, and in particular, headless CMSs, because that's how you identify, and that's sort of your your mm-hmm. milieu. Can you talk a little bit about the um, how you see the landscape of content management systems these days? Well, I mean, I think, I don't know what your listener base is. It seems like it's a lot on the content strategist side, uh, but developers, anybody really getting into content today and specifically into content management systems, um, headless is the way to go. Headless is pretty much the future. Uh, once you truly understand headless, it makes total sense why it's becoming so popular and why the old traditional monolithic uh, CMS is is going away uh, slowly. You know, they still have a lot of people on on regular um, CMSs, old school CMSs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and why headless is 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 really becoming the 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 wave of the future. Um, you know, we no longer have uh, web as a delivery channel, just web only, just the browser, right? It used to be where everybody went to the browser and you research on it. But now everybody uses this at a minimum. Uh, we have uh, uh, other kinds of devices like let's say an Alexa or um, anything else, right? Like a, a Google uh, device, I forgot what they call that, but IoT devices, right? So there is a variety of ways to get to content and with a headless CMS, because it, it completely decouples that delivery channel which traditionally your monolithic CMS would come with the back end and the front end all tied together, forcing you to a, a particular way of doing things. It completely decouples that and it allows you to focus on your content on the back end and create a content model that makes sense for your domain, for your business. But then on the front end, you can uh, deliver that same content to multiple places. The other thing that's really important with headless is the support for single source of truth. Right now, people, uh, well, not right now, but people in traditional CMSs, you end up duplicating content. And that may not seem like a big deal, but if you have, let's say, a thousand places where you have an address, and now you have to update that address, now you got to have to go to a thousand places where with a headless CMS, because it supports single source of truth, um, and there is techniques to ways of supporting single source of truth, but 
uh, you go to one place, update that, uh, that uh, let's say, address or that uh, author name or whatever you're updating, and it, it just automatically goes to all these places that you're using that information. Um, that's why headless is really becoming the, the way forward. Yeah, I completely agree with that, that <clears throat> that's the obvious way forward to, to deal with this omnichannel world that we're in. But it's, <clears throat> I think a lot of people in the content strategy world are frustrated with the slow adoption of it because I think that has to do yeah. with a few things like the familiarity of a CM, of the old school CMSs. And they are pretty robust, well-developed systems at this point. But a lot of those things you're talking about, <clears throat> the ability to single source all the, you know, the, the crucial information that your customers need, and they don't care whether they're looking at a website or looking on a device or talking to a device or, or who knows, gesturing at something, you know, that, that could be uh, different ways of getting that. But, um, well, I guess, and regardless of whether you're in a CMS, a headless CMS or a conventional monolithic CMS, you need to have a feel for how things manifest in there. And that's where modeling comes in, right? Like no, no matter how you're doing it, whether you're in a conventional uh, CMS yeah. or, or, or headless, uh, tell me a little bit about how you would define for somebody who's new to the practice, what content modeling is. Yeah, definitely. Um, what I want to, I'll touch up on that question real quick, but I want to go back to your comment, which I agree with the slow adoption of headless CMS. And I want to address that, why that's, I believe is happening. There are, as, as great as headless CMSs are, there are two things that radically need to change in people's mind when they're involved in a headless CMS project. Um, the first part is the complete separation of design with the content. Most people go into creating content models and we're gonna to touch what a content model is, but they go into there by saying, look, here's a web page. I want this content model to reflect this web page." where what you need to do is not talk about what it looks like, but the intent of the content. What is the intent of this content? What are you trying to do with this? And you build a, a, um, a, uh, ele a language elements based on that intent that then you create as objects in your headless CMS that represents the intent of the content, not how it looks. Because for example, the intent of an author would be to give information about the author, right? But on the web page, you're going to have an image and you're going to have the author's name and you're going to have perhaps a, a description. But on a mobile device, you may have all of that and some links. And on an IoT device, which doesn't display the image, you may have everything except the image, right? So what you need to do is focus on, okay, what is the intent of this author content? And what is it that we have to hold? And then how it's displayed and where we delivered is completely separate. So that's the first reason I think the adoption is slower because people are used to just designing their CMS around how it looks on the web. And you have to move away from that. Um, the second reason I think is because traditional CMS has come with templates, but they're forcing you in those templates. Headless CMSs don't come with any front end. So that means that you could do whatever you want. You can create your content model, hold all the information, but to deliver it, you're always gonna have to code something. There aren't templates for you. Now there are starting um, scripts you can do, but in general, you don't have templates uh, and that turns off some people because they go, well, I just need a template. I don't care what it looks like because I'm okay with this template. So with a headless CMS, you're not going to have that. So I think there's there, the fact that you have to involve developers on your front end delivery channels and the fact that you've got to think differently about your content and separate that design and how it looks from the intent of what you're trying to portray with that content is what is making it probably go a little bit slower. But in the end, once people get it, it's going to take off and this is going to take over. Um, and I think there's going to come a time where we're going to have these templates based on the language that you want that be, you'll be able to add and manipulate uh, to a headless uh, CMS. But I think at the end of the day, users that are involved in headless CMS projects need to understand that your mindset is going to have to change from how your content looks to what is the essence of that content and what is the intent and purpose of that content. And then that's what's stored in your headless CMS. So anyway, I just wanted to address, because I think that's what, I don't know if you have any opinions on, on that too. Actually, I, I, I 
one thing that has helped me get wrap my head around headless over the last, I don't know, four or five years is like that notion of like that it all happens in one place in a monolithic CMS and kind of decoupling each part of it from that monolith is how I've been able to understand it. So you have that what you're talking about, the templates, those are the, like authoring templates, like how the information gets into that CMS. And then then we used to think about great, it's in there, you just hit publish and a web page shows up. Nowadays it's like, no, it's in there and you can do a web page if you want, if you have a web team developing right. web templates, or it can go to elect the Alexa team or it can go to, to wherever. So exactly. having those three kind of things like the authoring, the input experience, the storage and management experience, and then the display experience, kind of be separated out. That's that's how I separate it out in my yep, head. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Makes total sense, yeah, yep. yeah, definitely. Well, I guess, and and to get it, you know, to do that requires, well, I guess there's always been content models. Like you were alluding to earlier, the, the CMS has come out of the box. Like you inherit a content model when you buy a CMS. They have a, a way of doing things. And you they can force modify you to that, that right? Yeah, and they, they kind of force you into it. Um, so talk a little bit about like, um, and this is in many ways, potentially very liberating for content people. <laughs> I mean, it, it certainly is very liberating to, to separate the content from its, from its presentation and even a little bit from its authoring, you know, that you, there's a lot you can do in the middle now. Um, and that's where modeling comes in. I think like, how is this going to look in the system? Now, tell me a little bit about how you, like, how do you create those models? Like, and, and what yeah. do they look like? Uh, yeah. Definitely. So I think the first thing uh, that uh, users need to understand is a content model is created so you can build intelligent content. What is intelligent content? It's content that is self-describing, that you could, that a machine can look at and understand what it is. In a traditional CMS, you have a blob, basically, a rich text field, maybe some extra fields. But at the end of the day, there is no relationship between anything. So a blog article is just a blog article. You don't know really what the title is. You don't know what who the authors are. There's no direct connection and relationship between all that. And that's just on a blog article, but you can get really uh, sophisticated and more complicated with products and a variety of, of other things. So for example, a knowledge base that has maybe FAQs. Well, what is the relationship between the FAQ and the question and the answer? And do you need to reuse that question and answer in other types of documents? So a content model is a, 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 a diagram uh, that really puts together a bunch of content types. And content types represent, uh, could represent a full document or could represent a partial, a part of a document. So let's take, for example, an FAQ. Let's say you have a knowledge base and you have FAQs on a variety, a variety of different FAQs, which consist of a variety of questions and answers. Uh, well, the document is the FAQ, right? So you create an FAQ document, but that document may be made up of two content types, the FAQ, which holds all the questions and a content type called questions, which holds questions and answers, right? And there may be a relationship between the FAQ docu uh, content type and the questions content type, which is a one-to-many, meaning one FAQ could have many questions. Why would you separate it like that? Well, now you know that this document of FAQ isn't just an HTML document if we put it in terms of web, but is really the essence is it's a it's a it's a grouping of a bunch of questions, uh, and they address a particular subject area, right? So, for example, you may have a lot of questions that says, "How do I add users or how do I manage users in my system?" As an example, that's an FAQ, and there may be twenty questions related to that with answers. But now you can take those answers, those questions that are separated, and there's a relationship and use them in, let's say, your release notes, or you can use them in another part of the website because it supports single source of truth. And now it's its own little thing that you can build a relationship to. So content modeling is really taking an unstructured document, analyzing it, breaking it apart into uh, objects called content types, building relationships, connecting those content types together. And what are the relationships of those? Um, and then putting it back together into a full document. The nice thing is now you can use all those parts, all those objects that are connected via relationships. You can use them anywhere you want. So if you create, if you have a product that has, that belongs to a company, well, the product is an object. The company is another object. You put them together and that is your product you display but you can also use that company somewhere else. For example, let's say that company also writes blog articles for you, 
not only do they sell products, but they also write blog articles. Well, now you can create a relationship between a article content type and the company and say that the article has a company, but a product also has a company. You can see how you can build all these relationships and and now you update the co- the company content type entry and it updates in both in product and in article single source of truth right that's and that benefit I, you kind of see that in the old model i mean th- that actually manifests a fair amount in old monolithic content management systems but there's something uniquely elegant about its expression in the headless cms and i think that kind of gets to like how people work together i think you used to have like publishing teams essentially working in a CMS and kind of going through that whole flow you just described. But like, and I guess this is where the necessity of modeling comes in is that you have to do a little bit of extra work to get these benefits you just described. Um, and is that, so So to do that work, you need to know the end use of it. You need to know like how the content creators work. You need to know how you're going to manage it and store it. So this, this sounds like it's maybe a little more collaborative than old school content management. It is very collaborative. Uh, when you go through a content modeling session, you need to uh, bring in a variety of uh, stakeholders. Um, Obviously, you need the architect that understands how to content model, but you need a subject or domain expert, right? An SME uh, to be there to understand, okay, what are we going to model here? So for example, I have a client where we're modeling logistics uh, and they literally move ships from route to route to route. They call them uh, legs. Uh, A route can have many legs. And uh, each leg will be traveled via ship in between um, uh, a variety of ports. So all of this, you need some sort of expert, right? Because I know how to create content models that then they can use all that information to present on the web or on mobile device, but don't understand how that works. So we bring in, for example, in this case, uh, somebody that understands logistics really well, understands the business really well. You want to bring in an author because content models will affect how they're entry their authoring experience works right so um and then you also have to bring in uh developers because developers need to then at the end of the day go and query all this information and present it in a delivery channel and uh and the the balance is striking the right balance where the author is happy and the developer is happy because sometimes things you you give to the author goes counter what the developer needs and vice versa. So it's, it's striking that balance between do we do we have a model here that works for the developer to get all the information they need to get to present it in all the delivery channels, but do we have a also do we have a content model that gives the author a good authoring experience that they don't have to do a hundred clicks. Uh, I, I don't have to, you know, they don't have to go and create this here and create it there and create it there. Now I have to attach all the relay. Do, do we have that? So it's always striking that balance um, to keep everybody as happy as possible. But at the end of the day, what you need to focus when you're content modeling and, and drive everybody back to is what is the purpose of this content? What is the intent? And I'll give you an example where I had a person uh, we did a content model and, uh, they had the ability to create tables and, 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 but they wanted to make sure that, uh, they weren't doing whatever they wanted to. And he's used to changing colors. And he came to me and goes, well, can I change a color on this? And I was like, no, we're not. That's the content model. Doesn't, doesn't track changing of colors because changing of colors is a design thing has nothing to do with. And he goes, but I want things in red. I'm like, okay, I understand you want things in red, but why do you want things in red? What does that really mean? What is the purpose of red? He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, what is, why are we changing things to red? If everything's black and this one word is red, why? He goes, oh, because it's important. I go, okay, so the intent of a red word is important. So what we're gonna do is create a content model that supports the communication element important. So when you create your text and you want something to be important, you will mark it as important. Now, the fact that important on the web browser is red has nothing to do with you as a content author. That's decided by how we're gonna display it. But on the mobile device, that important word could be blue. And in an IoT device, because it's it's spoken, that important word maybe will be emphasized more by by the IoT device as opposed to showing in red. So they quickly understood that, okay, I don't really need the flexibility to make this red or make this big or make it small. What I need to understand is why are we making it red? 
why are we making it bold or why are we making it big? Because that's the intent. Then you build in your content model objects that represent intent. Your authors will always author information in the CMS with intent, not with design. And then that content model and the content in it will scale forever with through your 100 redesigns. Because today you may want to represent the word in red. That's important. But tomorrow, we all know marketing changes constantly. It'll be blue underlined with a squiggly pink line or whatever, right? As a silly example. But do we now support that in the CMS? No, we just say, hey, this is important. This word is important. Market is important. The front end decides how to display that. The way you just described that, I think one of the generic benefits of modeling your content that comes up all the time is future proofing it. Like exactly. you never know how it might be, like how you emphasize things in a new platform or a, a different context. Right. So that seems really important. I also love as an old time uh, content person who for many years just filled in boxes that developers had created. I got to say that I love that it's more collaborative and, and uh, uh, these days that, and that, but also have you worked a lot with the authors because that's a a way different authoring experience from the old like WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get yeah. uh, thing like in WordPress is a classic example that anybody can crank that up in five minutes and, and get started. And part of the appeal of that for like an individual author and maybe a small scale business is, wow, I can see what I've done immediately. And they're just looking mm -hmm. at a website. Have yeah. you had experience kind of convincing authors to think about that process differently? Every single day, <laughs> because no, I mean, I mean, I'm not kidding you it yeah. is um, every day uh, at the end of the day, they go, well, where do I put my HTML? There is no HTML here. You're putting content. Well, where do I, where do I put the table with the border? I go, there is no table with the border. There's a table that has headers and it has rows and columns and you build the relationship. The front end decides. So honestly, as a content modeling architect, Part of your job is not just to create the content model, but is to educate and evangelize the new way of doing. Instead of, you have to tell people, look, I understand you're always thinking in, in, in terms of design and how it looks, but that's going to change. And it'll change not only tomorrow for your same device, but it'll change for all the delivery channels. So for example, you may have content that not only is displayed on the website and an IoT device, but in a chatbot, right? So remember, we go back to the, Example, FAQ, and FAQ has many questions, but now because we have questions as a separate object uh, that maybe is tagged with some metadata, we can now use those questions to answer, that those questions have answers, right? We can now use those questions, not only in FAQs, but to drive a conversation inside a chatbot because it has metadata with it, right? So that's the key. And as a content model uh, modeler, you have to not only uh, guide people through, um, creating a scalable content model, but also teach them a lot about new ways of thinking uh, of, of, of how do you, how do you manage content, especially authors. And how do, I, I probably say three to four times a day, I'll say, um, Hey, we're not talking about design. Remember, we're talking about the intent of the content and they always go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. And then but they understand it, but it's the instinct, it's the instinct, but, but I want red, I want border, I want blue, you know? So yes, it's um, a lot of this right now is a lot of education we have to do and a lot of evangelizing because some of, some, some of them will say, you know, this is too complicated. This doesn't make sense. We've done it for 10 years this way. Why can't we just do it this way? And a lot of them want to create, and I've seen where people use a headless CMS Oh, we're on a headless CMS. Then you look at their content model and basically it's a regular CMS because they just have a rich text field where they get to do whatever they want. And that gets into like, that education and evangelism, you talked mostly about authors there because that's the question I asked, but but there's a whole lot. There's both the out to the side, out to the designers and developers. They're working in a different way as well. But one I'm really curious about is going up, like up to the decision makers about this is a new way of thinking about it. And in fact, I think one of the obstacles I see to a headless adoption is that it's like, you don't just buy a CMS and then hire some content creators and maybe an, an administrator to run the system. You have to really fundamentally rethink because you have this decoupled or head, you know, separate CMS, and then you have to build the front end. So you have to hire a bunch of like JavaScript or React, you know, front end talent, and then re-educate your, your folks. Have you had any experience convincing the check writers and decision makers about this stuff? 
I think for the check writers and decision makers, it makes a bit more sense because you're able to separate uh, the concerns and, and, and say, look, we can, we're going to invest on in the infrastructure and the base of the pyramid here, but all the other stuff we can always upgrade and we won't have to redo this infrastructure. So I think from their perspective, it makes a lot of sense. I think they get on board a bit quicker than maybe authors just because they're used to the traditional CMS. Um, but at the end of the day, right now where we're at with headless CMS, is, especially in the United States, Europe is a bit more ahead of the curve on that. Obviously, they, uh, the, a lot of the headless CMS uh, companies are from Europe, but I, most of my customers that I help in content modeling, they're in Europe. They're in Denmark, Germany, England. They're all there, basically. I only have one client in the United States, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, there's many more, but I'm just saying from my my client base. But um, I, I think they, they do get it already. Um, I don't think it requires that much convincing. Uh, for them, I think it's more on the probably the developer side and the authoring side. Now I'm really curious about the difference between Europe and America in, in headless adoption. What do you think is going on there? Well, I mean, I think a lot of the companies are in Europe that make the headless CMSs, right? So um, I, I really don't know why uh, Europe is adopting it faster. All I know based and just my experience is that uh, definitely I'm getting a lot more customers from Europe than I am from the United States. Um, it could be that uh, in the US, um, the traditional CMSs are still pretty strong out in the industry. Um, but yeah, that's my experience right now. Yeah, no, that's it. Because I'm just thinking, especially here on the West Coast of the US, <laughs> it's like, that's supposedly the, you know, the cool leading edge tech stuff. And yet we're behind on that. Anyhow, that'll be another episode down the road someplace. Yeah. Hey, Marcelo, I noticed we're coming up close to time already. And, um, I, but I want to, I always like to give my guests an opportunity. Is there anything last, anything that's come up in this conversation that you want to follow up on or anything that's just on your mind about um, content modeling or headless CMSs and uh, the web in general? Yeah. yeah, I think, um, and nothing extra, but just to reiterate that I think people need to understand to truly make content uh, scalable um, and easy, easier to maintain in your um, enterprise, you need to think of uh, when you're creating content models and when you're creating your project, think of the intent of the content, the purpose of it, why it exists, and don't only think of what it looks like today in the web, but what is, are you going to have other delivery channels in the future that I don't even know, uh, that you don't even know of? For example, are you going to go virtual reality? Do you need to present content there? Is there going to be anything else in the future that uh, we don't even know exists where we're going to be, maybe need to bring in content? Do we need to integrate part of this content into other systems? Do other systems require this information? Because when you're building your content model, you want to take all of that into account, not just the fact that I need a landing page today, but what's in this landing page? What is the intent of all this information? Uh, and yes, it is a little bit more work than just saying, hey, let's just add three rich text fields and let me do what I want. Of course, that's five minutes from the developer perspective is not going to be a big deal, but then you're going to end up with a mess and you're not going to end up with intelligent content. At the end of the day, you want to have intelligent structure content that you can build relationships with uh, in between them and reuse across your organization. That's the key. If you can get into that mindset, everything just falls into place from there. Uh, that's a great articulation of the benefits of this because it does seem like nobody, you know, why would you create the same content over and over again and, and build it separately for different systems? So, so I, yeah, I, that was a great summary of that. Well, uh, thanks so much, Marcel. Oh, one last thing. Um, what's the best way for people to stay in touch with you and Headless Creator? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, just visit headlesscreator.com. That's my site. Feel free to register. Uh, for the site, it's free, 100% free. And um, I also have a Slack channel, but uh, feel free to just go to headlesscreator.com, register there. And you can follow me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. It's all Headless Creator. But headlesscreator.com is the best place to go. Great. Well, thanks so much, Marcel. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Larry. Me too. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. I Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.